Okay, let's get started. Good morning and welcome to Maryland Business Adapts, an event of the Center for Global Business at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm Rebecca Bellinger, Executive Director of the Center for Global Business, and I will be serving as your MC this morning. The Maryland Business Adapts Initiative celebrates the resilience of Maryland companies in overcoming challenges to their global sales, teams, and operations during the pandemic. This event is a first of its kind. It's both a celebration of Maryland industry and a networking and learning opportunity. We hope that you will take away from this event not just new insights and new connections, but also resources and tools that you can apply in your own global business context. To help us get the most out of this morning's event, I'd like to share a few Zoom tips. First, the event is being recorded and parts of it will be available on the school's website for future viewing. To follow the event on Twitter, please use the hashtag MarylandBizAdapts as posted just now in the chat. Please take a moment now to switch your Zoom view to speaker view so that you can see the speakers throughout their presentations. You can do this by clicking view in the top right corner of your screen and choosing speaker view. Please also keep yourself on mute until we move into the breakout round tables later in the program. And if you're comfortable keeping your videos on, we encourage you to do so. Finally, if there are any technical difficulties on our end or on yours, we thank you in advance for your patience. This morning, we have two special guests joining us to kick off the event, and I'll be back after their remarks to provide more information about today's agenda, the center, our co-sponsors, and how this came together. But first, here to introduce our special guests is our new Dean at Marilyn Smith, Prabhudev Kanana. Dean Kanana took over the role in January of this year, and I am honored to have this first opportunity to officially introduce him to the Maryland business community. His goal for the summer is to build stronger partnerships with Maryland industry, and I think he'll be in good company today to do that. Thank you, Dean Kanana, for being with us this morning. And I believe you're on mute. That's most commonly used phrase in this world, I suppose. Um, so thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Really appreciate that. And good morning and welcome to all of you on behalf of Maryland Smith, and thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted we are hosting this event at Maryland Smith. I'm looking forward to meeting you everyone in person uh, in the future events, and we hope to do more of this on campus. When uh, Rebecca asked me to say a few words at this event, I couldn't wait. Maryland Business Adapts showcases the best of what we do as a business school. Harnessing the impressive intellect and expertise of our faculty, our centers of excellence, and our wider community and showing the difference we can make in the world, even in tumultuous times that we are in. To the businesses being honored today, let me be the first to celebrate your resilience in the face of unprecedented challenges and uncertainty. Today, we have two very important guests, as Rebecca just said, that we would like to hear from. I now have the privilege to introduce our first guest speaker, the senior US Senator from the state of Maryland, Senator Ben Cardin. Senator Cardin has devoted his life to public service, serving as Speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates, a congressman representing Maryland's third congressional district, and now a US Senator for the state of Maryland. He's a very strong advocate for the small business community. As chair of the Senate Small Business and Entrepreneurship Community, a committee, he, has, he was integral in getting critical funding passed to help small businesses weather the pandemic. Senator, we thank you for your hard work to aid small businesses, universities, and students during this challenging time. Really thank you from our heart. Well, Senator, being... Cardin, Senator Cardin also has strong ties to the University of Maryland. He graduated first in his class from the University of Maryland School of Law and his granddaughter is currently an undergraduate student at the College Park campus and hope to see her soon. Uh, we are grateful to you, Senator Cardin, for making time to be with us today. Uh, Senator, the floor is yours. Thank you for attending this morning. Well, Dean, first of all, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's wonderful to be with you. Uh, congratulations for what you are doing on campus. Uh, and uh, thank you for recognizing small businesses that have shown tremendous resiliency uh, during this pandemic. Uh, it is uh, it just shows one of the, the things that we know about small businesses, 
Uh, they have ingenuity, they have innovation, they figure out ways to get things done, uh, including dealing with uh, unexpected hurdles such as uh, a global pandemic. So uh, uh, congratulations to all the awardees and it really is a pleasure uh, to be with you. As the Dean pointed out, I, I do have the uh, honor of being the chair of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Committee in the United States Senate. And when I came to the Senate uh, in 2007, I asked to serve on the Small Business Committee. It's, it was not one of the major requests that new senators asked for a committee assignment, but I wanted it because I understood how important small businesses were to the state of Maryland how important small businesses were to our national economy. It not only is the job creator in our community, it's also where innovation takes place. And that has been demonstrated over and over again during COVID-19. So congratulations to all of you. Let me, if I might, point out an obvious factor. We honor five businesses today that showed resiliency, but small businesses do not have the same deep pockets that large companies have. So that when you go through an economic downturn, whether it's because of uh, whatever economic reason, whatever reason could be a pandemic, small businesses are not as likely to be able to survive that type of an economic downturn. So we recognized last March, we had to do something special in order to help small businesses. And Democrats and Republicans joined together in the CARES Act last March with an unprecedented effort to keep small businesses uh, alive during this pandemic. And we passed uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. We uh, made small businesses eligible for the Idle in Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. We created uh, an Idle Advance Program for the most vulnerable small businesses. We put in a loan forgiveness program. We did all that in an effort to keep small businesses afloat and we adjusted it over the year, uh, including putting more money into the program, changing the qualifications, adding more uh, benefits under the program, and including uh, some special issues, and I'll talk about that, that was included in the American Rescue Plan under President Biden. So in all total, as a result of congressional action, the Small Business Administration was able to give out over one trillion dollars in assistance uh, from the pandemic as a result of the pandemic to small businesses. This was unprecedented. It significantly increased the, uh, the ability of the Small Business Administration to respond uh, to this national crisis. So let me just give you the update of where we are. In the Paycheck Protection Program, which was the most popular of the programs, uh, it uh, was uh, able to first give up to two and a half months of income based upon pre-COVID uh, payroll. Uh, 11 million small businesses have participated in the 7A forgivable PPP loans, 11 million to the tune of $791 billion. In Maryland, over 87,000 small businesses in our state have benefited to the tune of over $10 billion in assistance. Uh, we added more money to it. We targeted the program. The initial lesson that we learned was that, and we were concerned about this from the beginning, that the 7A program, which is where the P PPP program originates, requires that you have a private financial institution willing to guarantee a loan, willing to make a loan that the government will guarantee. For small businesses and underserved communities, minority small businesses, uh, small businesses that do not have a preferred relationship with a banking institution, we found out it was very difficult for them to be able to get a loan. So we needed to target the money. And as we continue to put more money in the PPP program, we walled off funds to be given through mission lenders, the community development financial institutions. We strengthened the CDFI's capacity uh, to uh, be available in underserved communities. We uh, required that a certain amount of the funds be used for certain types of small businesses. We did what we could to target those funds into the underserved community. And as we've looked at the evolution of the PPP program, 
more and more the help is now going to those that are in underserved communities. So we were successful to a, a large degree in getting the funds to where it needs to be under the Paycheck Protection Program. And as you know, the second round of PPP was targeted to those businesses that could demonstrate a significant revenue loss as a result of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Current status, the program is closed. It was, it was scheduled to close at the end of May. It closed a few weeks earlier because we ran out of funds. Uh, we do have one group of eligible individuals that we are concerned about. Uh, President Biden changed the definition for the self-employed, those who use the, uh, the, the C schedule income uh, and don't necessarily have payroll that they pay. Uh, they changed the definition on how they could calculate their uh, uh, forgivable loan. We in Congress want to make that retroactive. And if we do, then we would add more money to the program to deal with it. There's no assurance that that will happen. In the IDLE program, uh, we have seen a uh, significant use in Maryland. And uh, we've had uh, nationwide, we've had 3.8 million businesses that have taken out $270 billion of long-term low interest loans under the uh, IDLE loan program. In Maryland, there are 70,000 businesses that have taken advantage of it to the tune of $3.7 billion. We created an IDLE advance program uh, up to $10,000 initially. Uh, now it's up to $15,000, depending again on targeting it to the small businesses who need the funds the most. That program is open. There's, there, there's substantial uh, capacity to give more idle advances. And the idle loan program is also open and has capacity. So just wanted to point that out, that that program is still very much available. The loan forgiveness program uh, for 7A and 504 loans that were taken out during this period of time or before the COVID-19, uh, that, that, uh, that those uh, program that is coming to an end, it's just about, in fact, it ends this month. Uh, and we don't ex know wh whether that'll be continued. I would expect that it will not be continued. So that program is coming to a close. So let me just go over where we are today and then talk a little bit about uh, the issue that you're directly interested in, that's export activity. Uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, did provide funds for two more categories of small businesses. And, and these windows are now open, but in one case, we've already oversubscribed. And, and both of these categories are businesses that were ordered to uh, change their operations as a result of COVID-19. The first, of course, are restaurants. Uh, we uh, have seen a loss of two and a half million jobs in the restaurant uh, industry as a result of COVID-19. There are a lot of very small businesses uh, that are restaurants. Uh, we, uh, we know that uh, 110,000 closed their, their doors as a result of COVID-19. Uh, we have made special provisions in the past for restaurants, but we now have a separate program that will deal with their revenue losses. Uh, we have a, a, an exclusive period for women-owned restaurants, veterans, and those that come from socially and economically disadvantaged communities. Uh, we received uh, uh, more applications for this program than there are funds available. So at this particular moment, we're oversubscribed by almost $50 billion uh, on the program. Uh, the original $28 billion uh, is, is clearly not gonna be enough. Uh, whether Congress will provide more money or not is to be seen. Uh, I support more money going into the program and uh, we'll be working with my Republican colleagues to see whether we can not get bipartisan support to add more money to the, the restaurant program. The shuttered venue program, $16 billion. We've gotten 13,000 applications uh, to the tune of about $11 billion. So it looks like there's adequate funds to deal with shuttered venues. These are our entertainment centers, movie houses, museums, and it looks like uh, they will uh, be able to get uh, funds necessary to make up for their revenue losses. That program is open. So my priority for moving forward as the chair of the committee uh, is to deal with those that have been left behind, the self-employed, I've already mentioned that, uh, recognizing that we have to be nimble and flexible, not knowing what course COVID-19 will take. We're not out of the woods yet. We do see a light at the end of the tunnel, but we're far from uh, taking a victory lap at this point. So we're gonna stay tuned. If we need to do more, we're gonna be ready to take action. 
Uh, clearly, uh, President Biden wants to concentrate the efforts uh, of the tools to those communities that have been underserved in the past. We are looking at the 7A program, the 504 program. We are looking at microloans. We are looking at targeting to the underserved communities. I've introduced uh, legislation that would provide some new tools. Uh, one is the to codify uh, the minority business development agencies, which is under the Department of Commerce, which is the only agency really available for minority businesses. Uh, we recognize that in venture capital fields, it's very difficult for minority businesses to get help. Uh, I've introduced legislation that was set up an office of emerging markets within the capital office of SBA uh, to help minority small businesses get uh, venture capital. And the uplift bill, which has now been endorsed by the Biden administration that I introduced, would have the SBA partner with minority institutions, our, our HBCUs, uh, MDIs, to set up uh, incubator and accelerator programs uh, for small businesses. So these are all that are on the horizon. We have a lot of good ideas. Now, obviously, there are other issues. And I know you're concentrating on the export market. Export market has been very challenging for small businesses. We recognize that. That's why we have the STEP program, which is one of the programs that offer grants to state partners to help small businesses get access to foreign markets. That program has done very well. We've used, utilized it in Maryland and it has made connections. It's allowed small businesses to attend international conferences, to be represented by the state uh, and has secured contracts uh, with, uh, for small businesses in the international field. Uh, we also have uh, the SBA export loan program, which has also helped in, in that regard. So we have programs that we wanna fine tune. We recognize Again, small businesses do not have the same uh, deep pockets or don't have the same degree of capacity that larger companies have to, to navigate the international uh, scene. I do want to alert you. I serve also on the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, we are looking at the tax code. We do not believe the tax code keeps, treats small businesses fairly compared to larger companies. And we're going to be seeking changes in the tax code to help small companies uh, deal uh, with the tax burdens that we have today. We are also looking at the significant reform in the international tax structure to remove some of the disadvantages that American businesses have in international trade. So we are looking at those issues and we expect to have some action in this Congress to deal with the international tax regime as well as to help uh, small businesses. As we are conducting this conference, Congress is still consented, still considering the uh, uh, com International Competitiveness Bill. We're gonna pass that this coming Tuesday. In that bill are some additional help for investing in American companies in international uh, competition. And let me just point out in closing, there's opportunity under the American Jobs Plan to help small businesses. I'm working with the Biden administration as to how we can fine tune that. Uh, there's gonna be significant increase in procurement as a result of the American Jobs Plan. That's our infrastructure bill. And we wanna make sure that small businesses get their fair share uh, and that we use uh, the opportunities under the jobs plan uh, to help underserved communities and help small businesses in our community. So there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity uh, and uh, we look forward to working with you. And again, I, I thank you for having this opportunity to come together uh, to talk about opportunities for small businesses and honor those that have figured out how uh, to deal with our most recent challenges as a result of this global pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cardin. That was, you know, in unprecedented times, I think you as the Senator and the, and the entire Congress, you have done a lot of work to help the local businesses. Thank you. So I think we have uh, time for one question. I think you already addressed about the taxes, but this came to us. Uh, the small businesses are facing high tax rates in Maryland. And it hinders not just their profitability, but also their competitive competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the large businesses. So what can be done at the federal level to assist small businesses? You did, did touch upon it, but anything more specifics about it? Right. And we, we recognize the tax issues. Small businesses generally use the individual tax rate. They don't use the C rate. We recognize that. So when we talk about relief for, for uh, businesses as we did in the 2017 tax bill with a general reduction in the corporate tax rate, it didn't translate to help 
the same impact on small businesses. We know we have to pass through 20% provision in the tax code that does help small businesses, uh, but it still puts us at a, a, a competitive concern. Uh, we don't think the corporate tax rate in Maryland, uh, the local taxes are really impacting uh, uh, business decisions as to whether to locate in our state. It's one of many factors. Uh, taxes are a factor, but it's also access to labor and labor right now, the workforce is perhaps the most challenging uh, uh, factor for any business, including small businesses. Uh, so what we really do need to do is concentrate on those issues uh, and, and promote Maryland's um, advantages, our location, uh, the, the, the workforce, the academic institutions, including yours truly, uh, the uh, availability of close to federal facilities, the high tech workforce that we have in the state, the high tech companies that are located here, the biomech uh, research facilities that we have. And the state of Maryland through its initiatives have really concentrated in all those centers of excellence. So we have centers of excellence throughout our state that have really attracted the, the high tech industry and cybersecurity and the biotech uh, in, uh, in, in the military contractors. All that I think is a certain advantages. Uh, and I can tell you as the senior Senator from Maryland, uh, we are working very closely with Governor Hogan and our local officials to make Maryland as friendly as possible for all businesses, but we recognize a special responsibility for startup companies and, and young small businesses. And uh, we wanna make sure you know you're gonna have partners. We have plenty of in incubator opportunities in our state uh, and uh, we're open for business as the governor says. Thank you, Cardin. Well, Senator Cardin, I think we are running out of time. There are more questions. Hopefully we'll get another chance to speak to you to hear uh, your thoughts about some of the issues on and how the labor force is changing with AI and analytics coming in. We'd love to have more conversation with you. Uh, but thank you for all the work, Senator Cardin. Really appreciate that. And, and thank you for supporting the Maryland small business community. And more importantly, taking time from your business career to speak to us. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Everybody stay well and uh, let us know how we can help in Washington. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Bye-bye. Um, now we will switch gears and briefly talk about the Maryland Smith uh, School, uh, what we are and the commitment we have for small businesses. We are truly committed to tackling the world grand challenges with big ideas at the Smith School. With Smith's top ranked faculty and impressive intellectual capital, we are innovating and finding ways to make a difference in fields that deeply impact people's lives. For example, we have created an AI in healthcare certificate that provides healthcare professionals with an understanding of how AI applications and strategies are being deployed across the core functions of the healthcare field. Uh, um, Senator Cardin referred to PPP and we have faculty here. Uh, Mike Falkender is on the audience who was part of that big initiative uh, last year. Um, so we have tremendous amount of faculty strength in, this, uh, in uh, the Smith School to make an impact to society. In the classrooms, we offer a suite of business master's programs that prepare students for the future of work in fields such as business analytics, fintech, climate finance, marketing analytics, finance, quantitative finance, information systems, accounting, supply chain management, many, many areas we are uh, working at the Maryland Smith. Meanwhile, our MBA program remains among the best in the world and continues to attract the best and the brightest ranking number 26 recently by Bloomberg Business Week. Our undergraduate program is extremely competitive, and is very strong, and continues to be listed among the best in the world. This year it is ranked number 19 by US News and World Report. Uh, we, we are launching new honors programs, specialized programs at, at the intersection of CS and finance in the area of FinTech. We are very confident we'll move up in the ranking uh, worldwide. Uh, through under, uh, outstanding innovative programs and with help of our executive education team, which is committed to our goals of lifelong learning, we are empowering the Smith community to raise to meet the grand challenges we face. I personally look forward to meeting you all in these programs as guests, recruiting our talented students, or working with them to solve our business challenges in any number of our student consulting programs. Now we have our, our second guest speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Kelly Schulz, the Secretary of Commerce for the State of Maryland. 
Appointed in 2018, she brings years of experience working in the government, in the private sector, and as a small business owner to this post. She previously served as a secretary of Maryland Department of Labor and also member of the Maryland House of Delegates. At Maryland Commerce, Secretary Schulz has led more than 200 members in attracting and retaining companies, supporting small businesses and entrepreneurs, expanding the state's international reach, and driving tourism, film, and the arts. During COVID-19, she led the department in creating new assistance programs for businesses to help them stay afloat and participated in hundreds of virtual events and interviews to spread the word about the department's available assistance. Prior to embark embarking on a career of public service, Secretary Schulz sold real estate, worked as a program manager for a defense contractor, and was a part owner of a cybersecurity firm. Uh, Secretary Schulz is also a past board member of the Frederick County Habitat for Humanity. And we are truly thankful, Secretary Schulz, for making time to be with us today and share your remarks. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Konana. It, this is such a pleasure for us to be back to uh, really just kind of address the Maryland Business Adapt 2021. Uh, can't wait for all of us to meet in person again, and it was lovely to have a nice conversation with you earlier this morning. Um, quite an honor to be able to welcome you along with Senator Cardin, and uh, looking forward to uh, a lively discussion, I, I would say, today in ways in which we can work together. But we are here to celebrate some innovative businesses, and it always thrills me to have a chance to talk about the great things that our businesses are doing, because innovation is such a point of pride for us here in Maryland. We and state government, along with our partners in higher education, are always working to ensure that our state is a place that supports incredible, bold, new ideas, and that Maryland is a place where these ideas can take root and grow and flourish. So any occasion to highlight these ideas is a real treat and a reminder of why we do what we do at the Department of Commerce. We are here to support Maryland businesses and help them grow at Commerce. And a big part of that is providing them with the resources that will help bring their ideas to life, whether it's providing some type of funding or connecting them with the industry experts that we have on our team or fostering a community of businesses that our innovators can build the relationships that will nurture them into the future um, in so many different ways. Commerce is here to help. But before we start talking about our specific honorees, I wanna take a moment to recognize the fact that over the past year, we have all had to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances. This is not something that I need to remind any of you of. In our businesses, in our professional lives, in our personal lives, we were all facing sudden changes and new challenges that few, if any of us, were really in any way anticipating. Maybe you had to change your business model. Maybe you suddenly had to become a homeschool teacher. Maybe your kitchen table suddenly became your office. We were all fighting these battles in one way or another. So when the pandemic hit, uh, Commerce, along with so much of Maryland state government, acted quickly to support our business community. And here's a couple of ways that uh, we worked uh, with the business community. We immediately launched emergency grant and loan programs to support small businesses. This was followed by, eventually, more targeted grant programs aimed just at hotels and restaurants. As Senator Cardin had said, those were some that were the most immediate most long um, interactive and the most um, specifically um, hit. We also launched a grant program specifically to support Maryland manufacturers. And this was super important for many reasons. We wanted to make sure that they could quickly start or ramp up production of PPE and other equipment that was suddenly in such high demand. You remember those demands. Dozens, dozens of manufacturers use these grants to produce what we all know now to be um, in um, our, our ongoing future, actually. They were producing gowns, face shields, ventilator parts, and other essential equipment um, in order for our healthcare professionals to be able to treat the healthcare need. So that's resiliency right there. As we began the gradual reopening process, businesses were in need of PPE as well. 
which led us at Commerce to partner with Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership. Some of you may know them as the MEP network. And we launched the Maryland Manufacturing Network, which is a platform to connect companies with PPE suppliers. That was a big deal for everyone in the business community and local governments to be able to understand where to be able to get this, um, where to be able to get the supplies. Obtaining and using PPE was just one of the ways that the businesses had to adapt to what we call the new reality. Many could only operate at reduced capacity, had to enforce social distancing requirements, and had to adapt new cleaning procedures. Since these requirements varied from one type of business to another, Commerce convened 13 advisory groups with stakeholders from different industry sectors these groups helped us develop guidance and best practices that were unique to different types of businesses. And all of that information and all of that guidance was widely shared when we created new websites in order to be able to post and to be able to have that ongoing two-way communication with our business community. The travel restrictions brought on by the pandemic also posed enormous challenges for businesses looking to begin or expand their export oper operations. And I know we've talked about this several times with the, with the Smith School of Businesses, but these businesses are incredibly important to our economy. And international trade is not only good for the businesses themselves, but it helps promote Maryland and, it, and all of our assets, many of which um, Senator Cardin talked about, and the companies that we are going to export to. In a normal year, Commerce staff attends numerous international trade shows and expositions often with the delegation of Maryland businesses looking to tap into foreign markets. However, during COVID, we all had to adapt again, and we know what that was like. Commerce converted its usual trade show and mission schedule into a series of virtual trade missions, online meetings that connected businesses in Maryland with potential clients in Japan, Colombia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and also Mexico. More virtual missions are scheduled to connect with businesses in upcoming trips um, in the UK, Australia, and Korea. I should say virtual trips. Commerce also co-sponsored a series of webinars through the Maryland Partners in International Trade, or we call it MAPIT, uh, that alliance, along with our friends here at the Center for Global Business. So thank you for that. These webinars offered training in a number of topics including adapting and dealing with risk to help companies maintain and grow their global footprint, even in extraordinary times. And we made a key mod modification to our Export Maryland program, which hopefully many of you are aware of, and often helps companies cover travel costs for attending trade shows. And maybe some of you have taken advantage of that. During COVID, we worked with the SBA, which helps fund this program, to make more non-travel costs eligible for this program, including website upgrades and digital advertising so that Maryland companies could better use their online presence to compete in international markets. These are just a few examples of steps that we took at Commerce to help businesses adapt over the past 15 months. Hard to believe it's been 15 months, but here we are. I could not be prouder of how Maryland has endured this pandemic and how our economy is continuing to recover. In March, Maryland was one of only five states in the nation that outperformed the national average for both job loss year over year and for overall COVID-19 cases. Our most recent monthly job report brought good news with Maryland adding nearly 28,000 jobs in 2021 so far and more than 250,000 total jobs since the pandemic low in April of 2020. We saw tremendous gains in the professional and business services sector, which as of last month has made a full recovery from the pandemic. That's big news. And we saw some encouraging gains in the leisure and hospitality sector that we all care so much about, which we believe is only the beginning of a massive recovery as more people start traveling again. Our vaccination numbers, you read it in the paper every day, they've gone way up. Way up. We've made it to that 70% mark, well ahead of 
the um, Biden administration's goal of July 4th. We made it by Memorial Day, so good for us in Maryland. The COVID case numbers, as you, as you have seen, have gone way down, even since before March of 2020. We still need to be smart and careful, of course, and we need to stay safe, of course. But we can also be hopeful and very excited about the future and what's in store for the amazing Maryland businesses who are ready to show the world the great things that we can all do together. Well, I know I'm excited. I hope that you are all excited too, uh, because today we're honoring some of those companies, some of those Maryland companies that are really truly leading the way, and I can't wait to learn more about them. So I would just like to close uh, by congratulating today's honorees, uh, Miltech UV, United Source One, Rice International, Get Real Health, and Rovner Products. They have done tremendous work. They're gonna continue to do tremendous work. And I know that being uh, a participant with this organization is just gonna make them strive even more. So thank you very, very much again, Dean. And I look forward to any um, additional questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary Schultz. This was fascinating and congratulations uh, for being taking the leadership here for the state of Maryland. And in every dimension, you have really surpassed all the metrics. So thank you, thank you for all your work. So we have a few questions. As Secretary of Commerce, you know the Maryland economy far better than most. Uh, what do you see as the state's greatest strength? What do you see the biggest challenge we face and what can be done about it? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, I would say that one of our biggest strengths um, is, is that it, we help to fuel the economy in critical industries. Specifically, we have an incredible, incredible population of innovative minds. And I think we talk about the university system specifically um, and how we can provide those STEM workers to our innovative um, companies, whether they be entrepreneurs or some of the larger of the STEM companies. Um, Maryland has the highest concentration of employed doctoral scientists and engineers in any other state. And that's, that's a really good thing when we talk about expanding. We pride ourselves in innovation in Maryland, and we're just getting bigger and better and brighter with the most creative people. And the businesses that we're recruiting, they really do see that as one of our major advantages when they're looking to um, come to Maryland. This is happening um, in our research universities in our defense industry, in our military installations, and especially in our cybersecurity companies and our life science industries. Um, some very alarming and disruptive recent events have been ransomware attacks, um, as we all see. Um, and so our cyber community is gonna be very, very important. We have some exciting announcements about that that's gonna be coming up in the near future. And obviously we read about our life science companies and how they have been a participant in our health um, recovery as well. Another significant asset in Maryland, which we um, can also create challenges at the same time, is the strong federal presence in the state. This can be a source of stability, as we've seen, for contractors who work closely with the government since federal spending can be insulated from fluctuations in the economy. So Maryland, um, similar to other very heavy federal um, program states, um, has somewhat of a cushion there. But we also know at times when federal spending is being cut or restricted, then it can certainly squeeze some of our businesses who do rely on um, heavily of uh, uh, production of federal contracts. So we've been working for a few years to help our federal contractors diversify their client base, uh, which has been extremely successful. We don't want them to solely rely on federal dollars and we want them to have more incoming um, jobs and potential from the private sector and I think that helps to diversify the state and it also helps all of those industries to build resiliency. Yeah, that's wonderful. Just re related to your uh, answer, uh, we briefly discussed one of your priorities is to bring manufacturing jobs. Uh, when you talk about manufacturing jobs, then you talk about the talent to feed into the manufacturing industry. Are there any improvements that can be made to technical job training and education at the community college level? that will allow manufacturers to then recruit and hire local employees that have more skills to offer? Yeah, I think it's really important to be able to discuss um, the manufacturing community, especially since we're talking about reshoring um, specifically. 
Uh, and this is going to be a big topic of conversation, I know, at the federal level. And we at the state level are working diligently to be able to make sure that we are ready for those businesses that do want to take part in some of those reshoring efforts. But I think as far as the collaboration between, you know, those businesses um, that are manufacturing are looking to be able to provide a solid workforce, the most important thing that they can do is, is look at the specific types of training that's needed within their industry, whether it be manufacturing or any other industry and providing that information to the community colleges and to the higher ed university system in general to be able to make sure that students are graduating or getting certi certifications in areas that specifically meets the needs of um, those industry groups. And obviously, you introduced me and uh, reminded me that I was also the Secretary of Labor for four years. And those communications are extremely important as a back and forth dialogue to be able to make sure that needs are being met. So one last question. Um, so how do you see the role of the state's university system in making the state more globally competitive? And what can be done to foster greater collaboration between businesses and universities? Yeah, well, I, I would say that the university system, when we're selling the state of Maryland and trying to attract businesses both globally um, and domestically, the university system is one of our greatest assets and one of our greatest resources because they are the suppliers of the talent and also the research um, that we can uh, be able to extrapolate into what their business needs are. If Maryland is known as a place to find smart people and innovative minds, it builds our state's brand, right? And that just helps us even more at the Department of Commerce to market to the needs of the global business community. Likewise, we support the research and technology that's being developed within the university system. Um, it helps to facilitate tech, trans tech transfer from some of our leading lab spaces. Um, if your businesses don't know, uh, we have 74 federal lab spaces um, in the state of Maryland more than any other state. So direct communication and collaboration amongst all the stakeholders is always gonna be the key um, in order to be able to grow and expand. Thank you, Secretary Scholz. Uh, for your work keeping Maryland open for business during this challenging year and supporting this event today and in the past as well. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dean. Thank you, Dean Kanana, Secretary Schultz. It's great to see you again. Um, thank you both of you for sharing your thoughts with us this morning and for all that you do to help Maryland businesses go global. And now for more Maryland Business Adapts. As you know, today's event is about celebrating the resilience of Maryland industry in overcoming the challenges of the global pandemic. And you may be wondering how all of this came together at the Smith School. So let me tell you a little bit about that. The Center for Global Business is the hub of global learning and activity at the Smith School. Part of our mission is to provide opportunities for our diverse community of students, faculty, staff, alumni, and the business community to gain global mindset and international business skills. We also serve as a resource in Maryland for local companies seeking to be competitive in the global marketplace. And we do this through direct service capacity building programs for businesses like internships and consulting projects, as well as through export education and promotion activities with partners like the Maryland Department of Commerce in the state, as well as the MAPIT Alliance that Secretary Scholz uh, mentioned. We are one of 15 recipients of a Title VI CYB grant administered by the U.S. Department of Education. And through this grant, we expand our mission outside of campus to support businesses like yours. Maryland Business Adapts came together as an initiative meant to shed light on how globally engaged companies have adapted to the pandemic business environment. In the fall, we issued a call for nominations for exporters who had exhibited resilience and innovation in continuing their global operations. A selection committee chose five companies from among those nominees, and our case writer worked with the selected companies throughout the spring to produce cast classroom cases and executive summaries that you saw on the website. And all of that comes together today as we celebrate and learn from our five honorees. And I'd like to thank the members of that selection committee now, Maryland's Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Signa Pringle, Academic Director of the Center for Global Business, Kisleo Prasad, and Title VI CYBE Director Emeritus from Texas A&M, Julian Gaspar, for all of their work on this project. And an extra special thanks goes to Julian for also working with the companies as our case writer. 
While we'll be recognizing these five small businesses later on in our program, we would be remiss to underestimate the effect of the pandemic on large companies in the state as well. Before I introduce our Maryland keynote speaker to talk about his company's experience, I'll take a few moments now to walk you through the rest of today's agenda. Everyone should have received an email yesterday from the center that included the program guide for today's event. You'll also see a link to that now in the chat. In the program, you'll find the agenda, speaker bios, more information about the Center for Global Business and the school, our event co-sponsors, and additional opportunities to engage with Marilyn Smith. And I encourage you all to browse through that as you're meeting more of our speakers today. After our keynote, we'll move into the recognition ceremony and the roundtables. And I'll provide more instructions on moving into those Zoom rooms later on. We'll meet back here after that for an innovation workshop that will tie everything together. So I do encourage everyone to stay with us throughout the end of the morning's program. And to close out the event, you'll see me back again for some final thoughts and thank yous and, and action items to take us forward. I'd also like to call your attention now to the chat box at the bottom of the screen. It is now open for comments and questions, so please feel free to use it through the rest of today's event. We'll be handling Q&A for our keynote, the breakout roundtables, and the innovation workshop via the chat. Please do remain on mute, however, while in this main room. And now, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our Maryland keynote speaker, Mr. Anthony Roche. Mr. Roche is Vice President of Human Relations, Corporate and Global Functions at McCormick & Company. He joined McCormick in Australia in 2012 as Senior Director for HR for McCormick Australia and Southeast Asia and relocated to Singapore in 2016 as a Vice President for HR Asia Pacific Zone. In 2020, Mr. Roche was appointed to his current role. And today he's joining us from London and will be relocating to Baltimore later this year. He is passionate about organizational culture, employee engagement, and building organizational resilience through dynamic leadership practices. Mr. Roche, welcome and thank you very much for being here with us. If you would like to share your screen with your slides, you should be able to do so now. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And it's, uh, I would just do that. Hopefully everyone should be able to see what I'm presenting. Just let me know if, uh, when it's come up. Okay, we got it. Got it? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you again, Rebecca, for your very, kind of words and a lovely introduction. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to, to recognise the, the previous guests, um, the special guests of Senator Cardin and Secretary Schultz for their words as well, um, but also for the invitation from, uh, from the university, particularly yourself and from Dean Kanana. Um, very honoured and privileged um, to be here, which is um, actually my first um, Maryland event. So as, uh, as Rebecca pointed out, I'm currently in London. I'm relocating, very much looking forward to relocating to Maryland in the new year, or sorry, later, later this year, going to a few more Ravens games. But what we're going to talk to, what I'm going to talk about today is really around how McCormick has um, experienced the pandemic and how we've, um, you know, um, how we've positioned ourselves to not only deal with the immediate but also looking forward into the future um, as we utilize that additional resilience that we've built um, to position ourselves forward um, yeah, into the future. Um, I think not unlike many of the examples that I'm looking forward to hearing more about, and I've already read up on some of the, uh, the award winners, um, I would also like to take the opportunity to congratulate them on all of the efforts and the, the work that they've done to, to emerge stronger um, throughout this pandemic. Um, so in terms of, you know, I, I've put a couple of slides together because I was thinking I've got, you know, 18 months, 15 months to reflect on, you know, all that's happened really in the last, you know, uh, over that time. And I've got 20 minutes to talk about it. So I thought let's condense it into a few slides that help me guide me through. Um, today, I'm really going to just focus on giving you an overview of and a snapshot of our performance and, um, and our growth objectives and our business priorities. Um, but the most, the majority of the conversation and the dialogue is really going to be more around how we've approached our people, which is the third pillar of our strategic roadmap. 
Um, to, I'll take you through the different phases and what we've done throughout those phases and how we've found solutions and pivoted to adapt to the new realities that we've all faced. Uh, as I also mentioned, looking further ahead, you know, how we're thinking about what the new normal will look like as an organisation, not only in the US and in Maryland, but around the world. Um, and also some current employment trends that I'm forecasting, um, you know, that I think would be interesting to share with, with yourselves as well and have some time for questions. So for those of you that know, uh, know McCormick, you may be familiar with our strategic roadmap and we have three pillars um, that underpin that, one being growth, um, performance and people. Uh, again, I'll, um, I'll give an overview of the growth and performance elements and spend the majority of the time really talking about the people pillar, which is the one that's most passionate of, that I'm about. Um, but also all of those um, three pillars are underpinned by our principles and in particular, you know, how we've really tried to leverage the power of people, that principle to, to really position ourselves for, um, you know, in a strong position moving forward. Um, I'm really excited about, you know, talking about this, this topic and before we get into what we've experienced, I mean, I look at resilience and how, you know, how we apply that. And how would you compare that? I compare it actually to building a muscle. You know, you put it under duress and a bit of pressure and a lot of hard work, but you but for it to grow, you also need to fuel it, right? So I um, and that's with you know taking care of it, giving it rest, giving it nourishment and things like that. So the topic in you know that I'm you know that we're talking about here and what we're recognizing here around resilience and innovation, um, I think is I just wanted to add that in. I think that's a really um, really good analogy and a really good comparison if we think about it in that way to um, both the nourishment as well as the training. Um, but the snapshot that we've had over the last say 15 months, you know, um, from a growth perspective, look, McCormick has been in a favorable position that, I don't know if there's anyone in this room that ate less during the pandemic and particularly eating at home. We had unprecedented demand in our consumer products in particular. Um, everyone was snacking at home, everyone was eating. We were very thankful for that. Um, so we saw in 2020 uh, an overall revenue rise of 5%. Um, that revenue rise um, was offset by a decline in our flavour solutions business, which actually has a big element, as you would know too, of um, you know, quick service restaurants and food service that obviously saw a decline. Um, but overall, um, the, the growth in the, in the consumer segment really, um, really lifted us up um, to achieve that overall 5% growth. Q1 this year, we're actually, we're seeing, we talked a, um, a little earlier around the, the resurgence of in a lot of the economies. We're starting to see more of the out, you know, dining out. Um, so the flavour solutions business is bouncing back. Um, we're seeing 20% plus revenue growth um, in Q1 this, you know, in, in this Q1 and this quarter. So very excited with, um, about the continued um, growth within our, within our industry, but also within our business. Um, obviously with a lot of the activity and working from home um, uh, and remote um, elements of, uh, of the public, um, we've seen a big uptick, of course, as have many businesses in our digital and e-commerce um, businesses as well. If you combine all of that, we just when we didn't think we had enough on our plate, um, we also acquired two businesses throughout the year, um, one being Cholula Hot Sauce and the other one being Flavors of North America, Fona, um, which is within the uh, flavors and, and extracts business. Um, on the performance side of things, so just, you know, so, so but actually before I get on the, onto that, so the big challenge for us really was how are we really going to keep up with that surge in demand and make sure that we meet the needs of our customers and not, to not, and not um, short them in terms of stock. So, you know, the biggest challenges for us were really around, around the performance side of the equation. So we obviously had lockdown, not just in the US, but across the world, um, lockdown situations um, that really disrupted our supply chain, not only from a manufacturing perspective, but a raw materials and sourcing perspective. Um, changing and evolving government regulations that were restricting to international logistics, import controls, quarantines, delays, 
Um, not to mention over an EMEA Brexit happening at the same time. So a lot of complications in the EMEA and UK supply chain around uh, import restrictions and regulations. Uh, we've also experienced a lot of cost pressures, um, particularly around commodity prices, um, distribution costs. Um, uh, and you know, one of the things that's been really, you know, whilst it hasn't offset the price increase, um, but to ensure the continuity of supply, business continuity plans, our, our partners with you know, third party manufacturers and our distributors and our suppliers have been has been really critical to ensure that you know, we can we can maximize our, our, um, our manufacturing output and get that product out to our customers and then onto our shelves. Uh, another challenge from uh, from a performance perspective has just been you know, the variability of labor. Um, and you know, increase not only an increase in COVID-related people costs, but also challenges around attendance. Whether that just be hesitancy about coming onto site, but also having to provide not only um, you know, provide care for family members as caregivers, or they might be impacted by COVID themselves. Um, and as all, as also um, has already been mentioned. Um, just the COVID safe working practices that we had to put in place and ensure PPE availability to our staff. You know, these were just some of the pressures that we that we really saw as an organisation as it related to performance and, uh, you know, and really performing at our peak. So I'll move then into really switching focus with that context in mind um, to just how we've been thinking about, um, you know, the people element of it and how our people have really adapted and what principles we've really taken to that. Um, what we wanted to do is to make sure that whilst things might be evolving at different paces at different parts of the world, that we had some general principles that we would apply to everyone. And whether it be a timing or, or um, a timing issue and when it would be applied in a particular country, or it might be applied a little bit differently, those underlying principles were, were generally the same. But they first and foremost had the health and well-being and the safety of our employees um, in mind to ensure that we get them through what has been really the most you know, unprecedented time in anyone's um, living memory. So the in terms of looking at it from a from a people perspective, we, I wanted to take you through how we see the the kind of the the, the phases of the journey. Um, and this is, you know applicable again to everyone around the world you know from the start of the pandemic you know there was no playbook for this no one really knew what was you know what you know what we were supposed to do how long it was going to go on for um you know and you know everything was new and uncertain um what i would say is it was interesting actually coming from asia who had some more experience in dealing with pandemics that had sars outbreaks before that didn't go global in nature but the way in which they responded and the speed in which they responded based on that past experience was was very interesting um i remember um as soon as it broke out in china before it even reached singapore everyone was wearing masks every building was temperature screening um, it's like they had done it just the week before and they knew exactly what to do um, you know and then we were having i remember having calls with some of my, my global counterparts saying this is happening this is going on and um, because of that lack of experience in other parts of the world in north america and emea um when we were we were we were actually saying well, this is what we're doing and we're providing ppe and everyone's wearing masks and we're temperature screening the initial reaction you know and understandably so was we can't ask employees to do that we can't ask employees to put on a mask we can't even ask employees whether we can take their temperature so just the the, the initial response in the and i guess the cultural um elements that impacted the response I think was was an interesting learning and I think nothing teaches you like the past experience and as I said that because that Asia had been through it before they were in a they were in a different position and managed it uh, I would say quicker um then we really moved into a you know I, I would say you know three or four months into a phase where we're starting to see some more trends we're starting to get used to the vulnerability of um 
infection rates going up and down and seeing, you know, and, 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 and responding accordingly to that. You know, information still emerging, but we're, we're getting enough information that we're starting to be able to trial, you know, certain things and, you know, and certain approaches. Um, but really the still the full spectrum of kind of employee behavior, um, people behavior in general is just still emerging and just the full spectrum of that. Um, where people are either complacent about it or they're extremely concerned um, and, and anxious um, about the situation. Um, and then we're also in this period where, you know, schools are closing. Um, there's a lot of caregiving requirements um, being held to, you know, that the employees are now being asked to do homeschooling, caring for, for, elderly, for, for others, as well as do their day jobs. So just all of this was happening in that time of test and learn and, and uncertainty. And then I think now we're really getting to the, to the phase where, um, you know, where, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to understand what this way forward what this new, what, what, what this new normal is going to look like, how long we were going to live with, I would say a suppressed level of COVID um, as vaccinations go up in many countries, vaccination rates go up in many countries, will it go away? Probably not. It might be like a, an annual flu shot in, in the future, but nonetheless, um, the duration of what, how long we've been going through, all of this for has certainly changed how employees and the candidate market view work, right? And, you know, and have developed a set of preferences around that, um, you know, based on the experience. So as an organisation, we certainly need to be looking at, at that um, what not only what our employees want, but but you know what's what, what's going to appeal to the 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 generation of um, of candidates coming coming forward into the future. Um, I think that this pandemic's actually accelerated a lot of the trends that we were already seeing. Um, but uh, yeah, we can talk. We will talk a little bit more about that in uh, in the subsequent slides. Um, underpinning our approach, I think the first and foremost element um, you know that was most critical to us is ensure that we were really listening to um, everything that was going on on the ground from an, uh, from an employee perspective listening both formally and for, uh, and informally and not just doing a, a survey online as an example to to test how people are thinking but really making sure that we're in that our managers were engaging in what we called caring conversations with their employees. Um, it, I think it was, it's an interesting time whereby I don't think that we've ever had, I guess, license to have such personal conversations with the employees as what we've had over the last 12, 18 months, um, where we're talking to them, not about getting the job done on a nine to five basis, but how is life at home? How are things at home? How are, how are you coping? Um, you know, talking about things like stress, mental health, you know, childcare, you know, even death and bereavement. Unfortunately, a lot of people have gone through that, you know, so much more personal conversation and making sure that managers were really in touch, um, you know, with their employees about how they're feeling and their overall well-being, which obviously will impact you know, what they can bring to the table from a work perspective and, the, from a, and a capacity perspective. Um, so I thought that was very critical. And as I said, the managers themselves were going through it as well too. So we did put some resources um, together very quickly on how to sort of train and guide all of the managers in McCormick around the world on just how to have this simple conversation. It wasn't complex, but just some simple guiding points to help them through through that. and and. Um, and really, you know, gathering the feedback from the organisation, from the managers, you know, that really helped us shape, um, you know, shape our path forward. Um, so it wasn't just the, the the regular conversations. It was it was also some formal pulse checks that we did online, and you know, just got the data. Some of it was things like just how are you feeling in general, and your, your different levels of anxiety. Um, what tools and resources they are needing that would be able to be more helpful from you know whether it be IT equipment um, you know time work scheduling anything that will make their 
their workday um, more effective or more productive and overall you know, more efficient. Um, but it was really, really open. And the, and the subjects of what we were asking were very broad and we were very overwhelmed by how much people wanted to contribute back. So it provided us a lot of insight and data um, into this sentiment on the ground for, for all of our employees. Um, as I said, it, it was just really about continuous connection and engagement. You know, it was it was really one of the key parts of managing what was really continuous and sustained um, stressful change. And I think the, you know, the most important part was that employees felt that they were supported by their manager and you know, manager was supported by their manager too. It just had that knock on effect throughout the organization. Um, so not only listening internally, but also simultaneously, you know, even forums like this where businesses get to come together, we, you know, had to exchange information and what people were doing, what the market was doing, what other organizations were doing. Um, you know, we, we also wanted to make sure that, you know, um, we, we were just getting that external best practice, um, you know, and, and listening externally to, to the trends um, before we race to put anything in place. So just a well-rounded sort of strategy around continuous listening um, internally and externally to really help us shape our strategy moving, moving forward. And, you know, I wouldn't even say it was a strategy at the start. It was really test and learn, see how you see how we go but you know we had some solid data behind us um, in whatever we we're putting in into place um, so a lot of the things that we we did was really around that support and creating that support resource um, for our organization we actually branded that together at McCormick and that was really around trying to send a signal to our employees that everyone was going through this together. Um, so that was a bit of the purpose behind the, the branding there, if you like. Um, a lot of the resources that we found, you know, we, we uh, you know, a lot of it was just accessible online, hints and tips for just, you know, generally how to build resilience, but overall work-life balance, you know, anything from, you know, um, you know, meditation or, you know, scheduling your work or prioritizing work. We, we clustered that into you know, a variety of categories, but really a central resort, uh, repository for employees where we just kept on adding to um, you know, daily, weekly, whenever new information became available. Um, not only the online resources, but also we, we held a variety of other training um, sessions and, and podcasts. Um, we, from a timing perspective, we were fortunate. We actually did put on, we, we have one global well-being lead, one employee actually that came on board about a year and a half ago, just prior to the, the COVID outbreak. So the timing was actually quite perfect. We, we don't have a, um, a huge um, uh, team in this area. As I said, it's, it's one person, but this person was very, very much focused on providing um, and pulling a lot of these resources together and getting it out there to, to the world. We didn't have time to translate it into every language, um, we, um, but wherever we could source locally, um, um, you know, locally translated um, materials, we would put that up there as well. Um, but the, the areas that we, that we really focused on was just cultivating, was firstly cultivating connections. You know, um, we were very conscious that um, we had a big 40%, you know, I would say, of our workforce that automatically went one day from being in the office and collaborating in person to all of a sudden working remotely. And just what that meant from, a, you know, how, you know, how to interact, how to keep those connections going um, when everything is just a Zoom or a Teams meeting, you're missing that, you know, uh, informal, I guess, in person interaction. So there were some tips around that and making making people and trying to ensure that people stayed connected. Um, Other things were around adapting work styles and agile scheduling. So we were also obviously we talked. I talked before about a lot of family commitments that people had that had impeded on you know, you know work and family commitments all coming together. Um, so it's around how can we get the work done in an adaptive, you know, flexible style. Um, 
and then other uh, other areas were on maximizing collaboration some tools for that and other some tools before i mentioned you know uh, mindfulness and meditation taking time out um, i mean that thing you know this area of of overall well-being rather than just health and safety has really come to the to the fore and has really been well received and well appreciated by our workforce so they're the three elements of our um, to call, of, of our together at McCormick strategy, um, put a lot of this online, but as I said, um, uh, also held some some really good web webcasts, um, either ourselves or through some other partnerships um, that we came across. We're also mindful that whilst we had a big chunk of our workforce that, that worked from where that went from the office environment to working at home, we also have the majority of our workforce who don't have that ability. So what we've also um, tried to ensure is that we, whilst we have two distinct employee populations in McCormick, one that has to be on site to, to physically make the product and others that have proven over the last year that they can work remote, we don't want to create a distinction in really how we look after people and how we treat people. So, um, you know, there was there was some things that we did specifically as well for the um, for the on site manufacturing distribution population um, to make them feel um, valued, appreciated um, and recognized as we went through some of those um, things were around the world, you know, it, it wasn't a huge supplement, it would probably it was probably 5% for a defined period of time but a pay supplement to all of our frontline workers. That was particularly at a point when there was a lot of anxiety just about going out into, you know, particularly in areas and in countries or geographies where the, um, where the, where the, uh, the rate was, with, um, the infection rate was very high. So a lot of anxiety in those, in those populations. And we want to try to offset that not as a compensation piece, but more of a appreciation. So we did a, a, a wage supplement there. Um, and again, we did that for every frontline worker around the world. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the they, there was executive presence at all of our sites. So whilst the managing director would be of Australia or Singapore or Thailand, China, Poland, wherever you were, um, if those roles were work from home roles, that they would be on site on a regular basis. It wouldn't just be the site manager and the team, um, that there was real executive presence there showing the appreciation physically, verbally, you know, to, to the workers to make sure that they, uh, you know, they understood the appreciation that, 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 and the sacrifice that they were making at that time. So that is really an overview of, um, you know, that I guess the hands-on, you know, physical, and psychological support that we were providing to our employees again uh, across the across the world and most recently in some geographies you know supporting directly um, the um, employee vaccination efforts um, as far as it's possible depending on the on the location we'll be able to provide more direct support in the US um, because the system is a little bit different, it's a bit more government run or government distributed in other geographies, but in the US certainly that's what um, we've been able to do, I think, in partnership with CVS, um, you know, actively providing the, the vaccinations to our employees. So in terms of moving ahead and looking into the next, fa next phase, um, we're already thinking around, okay, what is, what is it going to look like? What is the new normal going to, um, going to, going to be, um, you know, for us, um, you know, and, and all of you in the room as well, as well too. So um, I think there's a couple of considerations here. The first one is that recovery. Um, you know, we are very mindful that that recovery is very dependent on global vaccination rates. You can see the high vaccination rates in the UK and the US and a few other countries have really, really, you know, parallel pathing the same with the recovery of the economy. And, you know, and uh, so that is going to really be very staggered depending on, um, you know, the, the vaccination situation in each geography. We'll continue to have, and as I said before, a not only a continued focus on health and safety, but it's really going to be 
total well-being for all of our employees. So, you know, not just whether they're physically safe at work, but it's a total well-being and making sure that we're looking after the whole person uh, and making sure that they, body, mind, spirit, soul, are in the best um, shape that they possibly can be. Um, yeah, and as I said before, um, including direct support of, of, of vaccinations, but a much more holistic view um, of, of overall employee health and wellness. Uh, there's definitely been a shift in expectations as most, as, as, as there's been so much work from home over the last 18 months, of course, people have gotten used to that. So there, you know, there are many um, employees, managers, people that are thinking, well, if I've worked from home for the last 18 months, why can't I do that forever? But again, as an organisation, the position that we're taking is we, we certainly don't want to have a population that doesn't have that choice and a population that, you know, feels that they could work from anywhere, you know, and, you know, and, and, and does have that choice. So we're trying to really find, a, find that balance at that moment, at this moment, and trying to get that balance right so that, um, you know, we really just don't have, you know, too sharp a distinction um, between that. And I think ultimately McCormick is also probably like many of, of you in the room as well, um, a company that does very well when we're in-person collaboration and in-person collaboration and the relationship building, you cannot beat that in-person connection. So. You know, we're, um, we're, we're definitely moving towards a more flexible work environment, but we don't want to lose the value that can be gained from that in-person connection too. So just really balancing the remote work versus on-site and getting the balance right in that, in that respect is, is going to be critically important to us. As I said, you know, McCormick is a, is a manufacturing company. You know, we, we're a manufacturing company at heart. So you know, um, those, those employees that are in that situation, you know, we, we want to make sure that they see, um, you know, visible site leadership um, uh, supporting, supporting them. Um, you know, there might be roles that are based at a site that could work remote, but we're, we're encouraging those roles not to for that very reason. Um, you know, and as I said before, that in-person element to our, our culture and collaboration and how we interact, um, that's very important to, to us as an organisation. So in terms of moving towards what that will look like, we actually have done a role assessment broadly of, of all positions that we do have in the company all around the world and determine what ones actually must be on site versus what ones could be remote, whether it be partly remote or fully remote. Um, and so that assessment was done, I think a, a couple of months ago, and it's really then shaped what we're now um, calling my flex. So particular um, elements of the, or particular roles within our workforce are open to it. So it is the non-site based roles. Um, we're saying that employees are eligible to work for up to 50% over the course of one month um, within a communicable distance from their hub location. So it could be, you know, over a week, two days in, three days out of the office. It could be two weeks in, um, two weeks out of the office, but just on average, um, around 50% over the course of one month. It's obviously also based on you know, mutual trust um, and respect, which are two of our values. Um, it's only going, that flexibility is only going to work um, if those two um, values are, are really embedded. Um, there is definitely, you know, pockets of, you know, people that have some resistance around moving from what would they used to know to this model. Um, but it's something that, you know, again, we're, we're going to try it and we're going to test it out and see, um, you know, how it works. Um, but, you know, it will give us also the opportunity to help build further on that, those elements of trust and respect. Respecting not only that people have got lives outside of work, but maybe their lives have changed, you know, over the course of the pandemic, um, you know, but also respect for the business needs as well. 
um, but also the trust that, you know, whatever both the employee and the employer are trying to do, um, that, they're, that they're trusting that people are coming from, um, you know, the right intent. Mr. Rose, um, I'm going to jump in here if I can. It's Rebecca. I'm not sure you can see me on the screen. We are just about out of time, and I'm afraid we're not going to okay. get any questions. But if you had some oh, okay. final remarks, final thoughts you'd like to share with us, we we would love to hear that. No problem. No problem. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the final remarks really. I'm on my last slide now, Rebecca. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I mean, what I was really going to say is, I mean, it's really a time where we've just seen so much change. You know, it's change in the, the employment market in general. Just you know, just home life, work life, everything's shifting so quickly. And I think what what, what that is going to do, it's still evolving. But I think we'll see um, moving forward a few things a holistic view of the employee experience, right? And what does that mean from an employee value proposition? Not just the job, it's like, what else are you gonna do for me? Um, social issues, we've seen that a lot in the US, Black Lives Matter, that all came through. Um, that will continue to be important. Mental health will go to the mainstream. It, again, I touched on that earlier. It's not just about health, physical health and safety, it's all about mental health and well-being. Um, flexibility, we talked a lot about, um, you know, and just earning trust throughout all of those um, pieces, but particularly around the flexibility is critical. And just because where everything is thrown up and, you know, there's um, all of those elements, it really underpins the importance of communication and how we engage in a multidisciplinary um, communication way um, to, to enable employee engagement. Um, so that were my closing comments and yeah, any, you said no time for questions. Unfortunately, we are right at time. Um, so we're not going to be able to get to questions. There have been a number of interesting questions that have come in, but if you stick around and, and pro proceed to participate in one of the round tables, hopefully we'll get your, your ideas and comments um, during the next part of the event. Um, I would like to thank you, Anthony, for your remarks. Um, we can see that McCormick has had a lot to deal with this past year, as have all of our small businesses. And we really appreciate your giving us a peek, just a peek into how McCormick thinks and, and has responded. Um, so thank you again for being a part of, of this event. And I look forward to hosting you on campus in Maryland as, as soon as we can in the fall. Thank you so much again. It's a pleasure and um, congratulations again to everybody. Great, thank you. And now for the moment we've all been waiting for, the introduction of our honorees. This is the first year of what we hope will become an annual event of Maryland Business Adapts. The five companies selected by committee and being honored here today have not only exhibited resilience, innovation, and staying power, but they've demonstrated leadership in being willing to share their stories and strategies with all of us. So it goes without saying that each of these companies is to be commended. And while we can't hear everyone's applause, I know everyone at home is applauding. And I encourage all of our attendees to use the chat to express their congratulations. So without further ado, our first honoree is Miltech UV. Miltech UV, located in Stevensville, Maryland, is a manufacturer of UV curing equipment and related spare parts. Its revolutionary technologies have reduced the cost of manufacturing lithium ion batteries by utilizing UV curing processes. Miltech is being recognized today for maintaining cost efficiencies and restructuring its operations and for deterring competition from abroad through the diversification of product lines focus on both high value added technology and clean and sustainable energy products. Accepting the first of our five Maryland Business Adapts Awards is Bob Blanford, president of Miltech UV. Bob? Yes, Rebecca, thank you very much. Uh, that, that was a very nice introduction on Miltech and on behalf of all the employees on the Miltech UV team, I'd like to thank you and your entire organization and their dedication in working with Maryland businesses. And we're so honored to be one of the five companies to receive the Maryland Business Adapts Award. Um, we're, we're also very glad to have survived one of the most difficult years that we have ever encountered in our 31 year history. 
as we move forward, um, we want to put this behind us and take advantage of, of some opportunities that have been presented to us. Uh, I think we're a stronger organization, as most all of these five recipients are. Uh, we become certainly more wiser. Um, so thank you very much. Congratulations again. Our next honoree is United Source One. United Source One, located in Belcamp, Maryland, is a diversified international food distributor recognized for its export of premium American meats and other related products intended for the food service industry. US One is being recognized for its international corporate restructuring, focused specifically on financing and distribution, for identifying new opportunities to provide cold storage facilities to importing companies serving the US market, and for harnessing the power of government programs like the Payment Protection Program to keep its staff intact. And accepting the award this morning is Michael Imgarten, President and CEO of United Source One. Michael. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, fabulous job. Uh, my gosh, it's, a, it's an inspiration uh, to be a part of this and certainly an honor uh, to be recognized as a survivor, and that's the way we kind of feel about it. You know, we uh, before before the pandemic, as a young entrepreneurial company, especially uh, one that specializes in international business, which is a, an extra layer of complexity. Um, you know, we we have been through several near death experiences. I think we got up to number eight, and we said, "Well, let's not use number nine. Well, we've used number nine now, so we think we we. We're, we're at the point now where we're, we're done with that and we're ready to move on. Um, it's, it's nice, I'll tell you that the, the recognition uh, and the acknowledgement of what it takes to get through this uh, is, a, is a motivation for all of us here at United Source One. We're all extremely grateful because um, in the trenches the past year, it's, it's, been, it's been rough. It's been survival at its purest form. So. Uh, Thank you, Rebecca, and congratulations to uh, all the other honorees. We are most appreciative. Great, thank you, Michael. And again, congratulations. Our third honoree is Rife International. Rife International is a globally focused and award-winning energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable, con excuse me, construction firm headquartered in Rockville, Maryland, with international offices in Ghana and South Africa. Rife International is being recognized for reimagining the future of renewable energy and positioning the company for long-term global growth through innovative value-added services that have led to cost-saving operations, a leaner balance sheet, and increased profitability. All of that sounds wonderful. Accepting the award this morning is Kwabena Ose Sarpong, President and CEO of Rife International. Kwabena. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Uh, I'm accepting this on behalf of my team. It was a team effort and it's always a team effort. Uh, I also thank you for the various opportunities you've given us to work with the University of Maryland. Uh, thank uh, the secretary um, and Senator Cardin for being here as well to encourage us. I think it's been um, truly an honor uh, uh, to bring us on this stage. Um, Rife has been constantly evolving through this uh, pandemic and finding better ways to do things. And with partnerships like University of Maryland, I mean, things are going um, in the right direction. And we're happy to share also uh, with other business owners. You know, so thank you for this opportunity. Uh, looking forward to engaging further. Uh, thank you again. Congratulations. Our next honoree is Get Real Help. Get Real Health, located in Rockville, Maryland, is a domestic and international leader in the delivery of digital health solutions for large and small hospital systems, state health information exchanges, nonprofit organizations, national health ministries, and provincial governments. Get Real Health is being recognized today for its ability to adapt quickly by enhancing its existing products to empower patients during the pandemic thereby allowing individuals worldwide to utilize telehealth and remote patient monitoring to connect directly to their doctors from the safety of their homes. And accepting the award is Robin Wiener, president and founding partner of Get Real Health. Robin. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and um, good morning, everybody. 
We are so grateful to University of Maryland's Robert uh, H. School of Business and the co-sponsor for recognizing during this crazy time during the pandemic and recognizing innovation needed to happen to overcome this um, situation. Get Rail Health is proud to be chosen as an honoree and congratulates four other companies um, that have been chosen along with us. Uh, super interesting companies and really fantastic learning more about them. Um, but I really need to focus on this, this award really is a testament to our employees and when, who went above and beyond and thrived under these crazy consent um, time. Um, they worked day and night to be able to get us up into telehealth. We look forward to sharing our best practices today um, and learning from stories from the other Maryland businesses. Uh, and in the future, we will look forward to working closely with the business on the H, Robert H. Smith School of Business um, in their future endeavors as well. The future is looking bright. Thank you, Robin. I have to agree with that. Absolutely. And our final honoree this morning is Rovner Products. Rovner Products, based in Timonia, Maryland, is a designer, inventor, and manufacturer of woodwind instrument accessories and is known throughout the world for its line of classic and next generation ligatures. Rovner is being recognized today for its utilization of a customized ERP system that helped the company optimize its resources, strengthen stakeholder relationships, invest in new technology and train employees to take advantage of opportunities while maintaining IP protections in China. Accepting this award is George Reeder, president and co-owner with his wife, Lynn, of Rovner Products. George. Rebecca, thank you very much. It is, um, as a small business owner in the state of Maryland, I'm proud to be here today. On behalf of myself, my wife, our son, who is a principal in the company, and all of our employees were honored to have been chosen to share this experience. I'd like to express my gratitude to those in government, in academia, and the medical community whose combined efforts made this day possible. I look forward to what I know is going to be an enlightening and enriching event. I'd like to show you very quickly what is a ligature. And it started out with this little thing here, and it holds a reed onto a mouthpiece. This is a mouthpiece that is used for clarinets and saxophones. And prior to this invention, it was a piece of metal that held a reed on not very well and would get stepped on often. With our flexible ligature, you place the reed here, and now you have an impressive result, someone playing music. Our motto for our company is innovation by desire, performance by design. We want to thank you again for a local company with a global footprint, and, and I'll take it back to Rebecca. Great. Thank you, George, so much for that. And once again, congratulations to each of these outstanding exporters. Each of these companies will be receiving via mail or perhaps by special delivery um, a plaque from the Smith School that recognizes um, this award today. And now for the fun part, hearing more of their experiences in the field. In just a few moments, you all will follow the presidents and CEOs into your pre-selected breakout rooms to participate in the roundtable conversations. Each session will be moderated by a Maryland Smith faculty member and feature both a Q&A with the honoree and opportunities for you to ask questions and share your own experiences. In fact, I encourage you all to participate as much as possible. You will receive additional instructions once you're in the breakout sessions regarding the chat function, microphones, videos, and, and so on. And if you can't remember which session you chose when you registered, don't worry because the fantastic team at Maryland Smith recorded your selection at registration and has already set you up for that room. It looks like we've gotten everybody back or just about everybody. So I'd like to say congratulations again to Rovner, Miltech UV, Get Real Health, US One, and Rife International. And thank you to Suresh Acharya, Pam Armstrong, Mary Beth First, Martin Dresner, and Kenyon Crowley, our faculty facilitators, and Greg Rafal, Julie Neal, Adam Schwal, Kayla Rios, and Mary Biddle um, Tier Koenig, our room moderators for leading the breakout sessions featuring today's honorees. 
I hope that you all enjoyed meeting these companies and the talented faculty and staff that shared the breakout experience with you. And I also hope that you found the conversations robust and inspiring, and that you're all ready to tie everything together with the final session of this morning's event. And it's with great pleasure that I now introduce Oliver Schlocky to lead us through this 30 minute innovation rich session. Dr. Schlocky is a clinical professor here at Maryland Smith, a business consultant, entrepreneur, and researcher. His publications and research on scenario-based strategic planning and innovation strategy have been featured in leading academic and practitioner journals worldwide. Dr. Schlocky has been an international management consultant and strategic advisors for companies and government agencies in Europe and North America, and has received numerous accolades as a leading executive education facilitator here at the Smith School. And as a reminder, we'll be using the chat for comments and questions at the end. So Oliver, thanks so much for being here this morning. You should be all set to share your screen. All right, and since this is an international event, uh, as you can hear from my accent, I also checked that box. Um, so you hear a little bit of Arnold in between. Uh, so thanks, Rebecca. Um, we should be all, all good to go here on our little journey. Uh, I got 30 minutes. Uh, it's me between you and lunch. Um, so hopefully we uh, do this interactively and fun. Uh, for those of you who are, who are multitaskers and are excited about multitasking, uh, you can do something while we're going through this. We have three survey questions on the side. This is a software that some of you know. It's called Mentimeter, and we have a website here. It's called menti.com. It's very easy, menti.com. I put it in the chat and you need a code to get in there, 21078071, should be in the chat. And uh, you can let it rip in the, in the survey. We're gonna, if you have a few seconds at the end, I'll, I'll look quickly uh, into that. Um, so the session, what's this about? Well, the session is about adaptation. And I thought, you know, um, and then please bear with me, we all know, how severe this event there. Um, sometimes it's one of the best medicines to keep a kind of a humorous note on what had happened over the last uh, you know, months. I put together a couple of my adaptations here just to, to open it up. It doesn't come close to what these companies that we've seen uh, had gone through to adapt. But I, I remember a couple of things that, that I wanna point out. Uh, I think the most fascinating for me as an, as an uh, educator was that all of a sudden there are people still having books um, on Zoom calls on CNN. That was amazing. And my hobby was, okay, freeze the frame, enlarge the picture and see what they're actually reading. Um, there were companies who made a business out of that. You could actually uh, go there and buy books in bulk for your Zoom background, uh, which I think is, is a very appropriate idea to adapt quickly. We have live comedians you could rent for an hour to spice up your boring Zoom meetings. Uh, you couldn't buy a freezer anymore, which, which I think is a great opportunity to bring back these guys who bring frozen food to your house because the American uh, household now has extra freezer space. I think Michael from uh, United Source One, you, you, need to, you need to look at this business of delivering me some Black Angus uh, in a freezer truck. That might be an opportunity for you. Uh, down the road. The other most annoying thing for me was I had to drive my car to charge the battery. I didn't know that my car was draining battery just staying in the garage. So every every 10 days I had to make a fake run for anything just to keep the battery charged. Um, that was extremely annoying. And for the first time ever, students who usually do a startup business of delivering alcohol to their dorms I had to say it works because uh, part of the pandemic was the loosening of the regulation that we could now transport purchased alcohol in the state of Maryland. So my usual comment when they come up with the idea was uh, doesn't work regulations. And then they, they told me, uh-uh, they changed. And I said, okay, you're good to go. So, so why is adaptation so important in a, in a times like this? Well, adaptation is our human answer to shifting the fear of unknown towards the ability to deal with it, to adapt. Our usual response to fear and unknown is the typical freeze, fight, flight, and then forfeit mechanism. And adaptation is the positive way of dealing with it. The human, human nature is uh, about adaptation. We've adapted in so many ways. If you live in areas in the world that are 
quite inhabitable. We have found ways to do this. And by shifting the energy in these, in these organizations, we saw this in, in, the, in the conversations from, from Anthony, from, from McCormick, you know, shifting the energy to the adaptation, you kind of eliminate the past of fight, flight, fear for, uh, for fit. And so that's one of the great ways to deal with that uh, situation. So I wanna kind of give us an idea here. The, the conversation here in this little, little section is about what these companies accomplished and how they did it in summary from a, a little bit from an analytics point of view and then see, can we do better? I mean, they, we all managed through it, but it was difficult. Many of the companies had difficulties. Anthony talked about 60 days of trial and error and it wasn't even a strategy, right? Can we do better than this the next time around? Not for the next pandemic, we're probably prepared to some degree now, but there's all kinds of challenges ahead. And even if we don't have challenges, even if we don't have a crisis, the new economy, the what we would call industry 4.0 will be severely uh, challenging, even if everything goes smoothly. And so the term that many of you may have heard uh, in the last year is VUCA, right? That's the term that made its way. We talked about this here at the Smith School for, I, I remember me doing this for five years now. Uh, at that point, you know, not many people wanted to listen. Um, it's, it's, no, it's more a point now, but people start to listen. But VUCA is a short term. It describes our, you know, increasingly differently, difficult uh, business environment. It stands for volatility. You know, the, the impact it has, the, the immediate impact that we've seen from some of these companies who had to deal with, you know, closing shops down, uh, letting people, people go. The U in, in uh, VUCA is uncertainty. And it's kind of uh, our, a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, coaster that we all went through day by day when we saw numbers, when we saw, is there a vaccine coming? We saw hope here and then desperation and then the, uh, all this emotion. Dealing with uncertainty is, is going to be a major skill set that I see um, we, we have to adjust to. You know, the, the ability not to have a certain outcome uh, is disrupting our thinking and planning. But if this becomes a more you know, constant companion in our business world, it's gonna be challenging. Uh, complexity is the C in VUCA. And uh, well, it's uh, certainly now we know the different supply chains. I think Martin Dresner, if he's, if he's here, can appreciate that, that we are all now very familiar about the two different supply chains regarding toilet paper, which turned out to be there's a private household toilet paper that is two ply and soft. And then there's the toilet paper we get at work, which is one ply, good enough. But that one was plenty, uh, but we didn't have anything at home. And uh, so the complexity of these, uh, of these supply chains is now uh, fully aware. And if we adding an international component to this, it uh, just goes up exponentially. And the last element of VUCA is the increase in ambiguity. And I think many of us, especially if you of a scientific mindset, we got very frustrated that we did not have the perfect set of peer reviewed information regarding many of the aspects of the, of the crisis we had and dealing with this ambiguity with the uncertainty of information, the sourcing of information. Uh, I'm, not, I'm leaving completely out the political dimension that crept through all of that, but we, we saw that this is difficult. And so VUCA is here to stay. And I believe that the new economy, even without the pandemic and crisis, will have level, uh, a lot of elements uh, you know, for us. So I want to look at some five elements here that we saw from these companies, um, how they went through their adaptation, and then see, can we do better? What would be an even better way of dealing with a, with a crisis as we come on? There's a little bit of a a critique that is not leveled at the companies that we have here because they were awarded to dealing with this uh, fairly well. But it's a little bit of a critique here in some organizations who I believe did not do the proper strategic homework, if you will, when it comes to dealing uh, with crisis. We talk about resilience uh, to, make it, to make it through. And that is definitely um, kind of a hallmark of many of these companies and many of us too. Uh, not just here in this forum, but uh, beyond that, that we've made it through the, you know, it's definitely an admirable trait that we made it through this, through this time. And um, we have 
multiple examples, personal examples, business examples of that. For me, the challenge is here that resilience, as much as we can celebrate this and be proud of this, for me, it has a fast approaching expiration date. And uh, for me, I knew I could stand not being in work for a while. I had my break point at about 11 months. That's how far I could go. And after that, I said, now I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm ripe for it, right? But resilience, that is not even resilience. Resilience is really under pressure, constantly performing. And, and so it can work for a while, but I think we, these, these stores of resilience are pretty emptied with, with a lot of people. So we need to look at why, why did we end up needing resilience? And to me, it has its roots a lot in the push for more and more efficient and leaner organizations. There was just in many cases, not much meat left, uh, not, not to uh, focus on Michael's business here, but there was not enough left in the tank and, and a lot of redundancy was basically streamlined out of organizations. There was not a hidden storage room that had some extra supplies that you could go to and, and throw it out. There was nothing, uh, nothing that we could rely on to, to throw in. And redundancies uh, are expensive, but I think a lot of organizations should reconsider to see whether you should have redundancies or not. Um, I have an interesting example that I worked on over the over the last year. I worked with a uh, large manufacturer of detergents, things you can, you know, just washing washing detergent. And they said their major problem was they ran out of pallets. They just ran out of pallets to deliver their product to the large uh, retail retail chain. And they did this because they've moved from multiple suppliers of pallets to the one major supplier of pallets who guaranteed the pallets, but couldn't guarantee it. And they are already making changes by using some of the plastic waste of production to start a local supplier at each of their main production facilities and build up a green business that uses those plastic residue to create plastic pallets, delivery pallets, which is local, which is exclusive, and what they have, which they use on a day-to-day -day basis, but then also design it in a way that they can capture some of the overcapacity just in case there is a shortage of that, uh, you know, specific product. So redundancies, we need to, I think, talk about this a little bit more. How can we make the business not just resilient, but redundant in a, in a lot of ways. The natural instinct for all of us now is to get back, you know, get it back, rebuild it, and uh, get the pre-pandemic uh, economy going. And it's, it's human nature, right? It's, it's not just eco, uh, economically healing, uh, healing, but it's also you know, psychologically uh, and, and emotionally healing if we see things getting back to, to normal. But we, need, we have a chance here to look at a lot of business models that were actually, yeah, it, I would say their, their flaws were highlighted. Their flaws were accelerated during COVID. A lot of companies who did really poorly in COVID or had to shut down, those companies were in trouble already. The good or a normal economy let them, let them run fairly smoothly. But we need to have a chance now to look at business models and see what is it in our business model that we can change. Is this sustainable before we rebuild it to what we had be before? It's a good opportunity here to start uh, rethinking, you know, many of the businesses that, of course, have thrived in in the in the in the COVID time, the delivery businesses, uh, many other many other businesses who, you know, surprisingly did uh, did well. I, right now, I would love to lo love to own a uh, you know some some kind of lumber operation in the in in Washington State and cut a couple of two by fours. Uh, if you've been at Home Depot recently and wanted to rebuild something in your house, it's just ridiculous. It's cheaper to buy steel right now, I think, than, than two by fours. But we need to have this holistic assessment and uh, looking at the gig economy, whether this is a model going forward for people to have reliable, uh, reliable employment. Um, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity here to rethink before we uh, rebuild as this, uh, as we're kind of coming out of the, out of the crisis, a lot of these companies and uh, you know created new plans. You know, we're all surprised and created new plans. Anthony mentioned that uh, it took them 60 days 
to get something like a plan that even doesn't qualify as a strategy, right? For two months, they were just playing around with ideas, what could work, what couldn't work. And especially here, we have smaller businesses uh, that we awarded today. The complexities are, you know, small business doesn't mean small problems. They, they, they have uh, problems that are even harder to solve because of the complexity, especially when you add the international component. The problem is that we realize that we don't have this precious time to create straight, you know, straightforward new plans. The question is, what can we do about this? Can we put time in when the times are good so that when the times are bad, we can have kind of this time stored away that sounds like a strange science fiction movie, but there are actually ways we can do this and gain time and then deploy the time when we, when we actually need it, similar to, to a power plant who pumps water up a mountain and then releases the water when there's an over demand. What I encourage people to do is to build at least one plan B. Now we often say, I, I need a plan B. That is too late. When you say, I need a plan B, you did not have a plan B when you needed it. So a plan B is really a plan that you have today in parallel to your plan A that you can deploy when plan A or the assumptions for plan A don't work anymore. That's a true sense of a, of a plan B. So when the world changes or assumptions change, the, you have that plan in your drawer. You have developed it based on certain assumptions. You can have multiple of those, but you do these plans in not just in theory, you build them out while you are in good shape, while you have the resources, while you have a calm, uh, calm demeanor, while there's no pressure to complete on a certain, certain timeline. And so this type of planning, often called scenario-based planning, I spent most of my adult life doing this, helps by creating a plan for certain kind of eventualities. Now you would say, well, we cannot foresee everything, right? The, the pandemic was unforeseen. It's not about this. A major benefit of thinking about a plan B, a plan C, is that the value is in the planning, that you realize what resources you have, what you need to consider. So the planning here is more important than the effect, effectual plan, but the flexibility, the, the, the mentality that you develop is one of very flexible planning. And having a plan in your drawer when something happens, even if you have to just modify it, gives you at least a peace of mind that we have something that we can rely on when things go really, really bad. Protocols were eventually devised for a lot of things. And, uh, you know, a lot of companies had uh, change in routines, personal protection equipment, six, uh, six, feet, uh, six feet distancing. By the way, interesting left, in Europe, it was two meters. So in Europe, if you, if you want to be picky, they were 20 centimeters further apart. Um, that's so much for the imperial system, right? We should have gone seven feet and just beat them by 10 centimeters. But it's just me mocking about this. Um, the critical part is here that, as I mentioned before, we cannot build protocols for everything. So there's a limit of how much we can you know, build things under pressure, because that's the important thing. We have no chance to prepare. What I suggest, and this may come as a surprise for, for some of you, and I will we'll spend a few minutes later on, on this, is there are certain, certain things we can train ourselves to, to be even better when we have zero time to prepare. And the key to that is to create an ability to improvise in business, which sounds so absolutely non-planned. But uh, I'm gonna show you a few examples later on how you can include improvisation as one of your future, future skill sets to deal with uh, uncertainties. We had great stories of uh, executives who were on site where the crisis happened, you know, hands on management. Psychologically, uh, this is important. We have dozens, hundreds of people who would we, we would consider heroes by, by, you know, making sacrifices, putting, putting their life at risk and, uh, you know, celebrations are needed uh, as this event shows clearly. And it's important. The problem with that is, and that we need to, need to consider, when executives are doing hands-on crisis management, what is missing for them is the ability to plan what are we doing going forward, 
there's a lot of time at the executive level spent on the hands-on management on site. That time, in my opinion, in many cases could be used differently. I'm have mo having more on that as we, as we move forward. I would also love to see our definition of heroes to be expanded. I'd like to include the people in this definition who from now on prevent a crisis. You know, we, we love to celebrate the fireman who's rescuing the little child out of the, the building. No questions about that. But I also like to give an award to the janitor who for the last five years changed the nine volt battery in every uh, smoke detector in the building. So it will go off when the fire comes in. Those people need, I think, in my opinion, need to get the same recognition uh, for a somewhat heroic act because they make the crisis not even show up. And I think there's a, there's a certain amount of uh, benefit uh, to that. We'll talk in a few minutes about the skill that is connected with that. And that's the skill of strategic foresight and anticipation, the ability to anticipate what is coming. And this can be, can be trained and we can go all, do all better doing, doing this. So that leads me to things that we are concerned here at the Smith School, and that is how can we train people, how we can be transfer skills to students, to executives that we work with, um, you know, to prepare them for things, hopefully that we don't have to see as much anymore, but eventually in some form of capacity, crisis will pop up. And so I created two personas for this little session here today. One of the personas is the anticipator, um, so it sounds a little bit like Terminator. Uh, I told you there's a little bit of Arnold coming up. So I, they're, they're, they're personas, right? The marketing people can appreciate this. So what is an anticipator? It's a combination of a certain set of skills here. Um, the anticipator is somebody who can turn the clock. Similar with a plan B, if you anticipate things, that means you're doing the hard work, you're doing some of the prep work before you get into the event, into the crisis where you don't have the time, your time is occupied with something else. So anticipating events, foresight is to me, your, your banking time that you can release when the crisis hits. Um, here's an example of an anticipator uh, uh, you know, from, from the early days. This is the worst movie I could find about this. Uh, and this is about detecting early warning signs uh, when a crisis is about to happen. These are actually miners in 1926 who are, as we all know, and, and we know the saying, are placing little canary birds in the coal mine. And what they're doing basically is a life-saving early warning system because the idea was when the conditions for carbon monoxide were at a point where it gets poisonous, the animal would basically fall off and die, and the miner was constantly uh, looking at the uh, at the animal, and if the animal would be, you know, in, in bad shape, oops, uh, if the animal would fall down, he knew the conditions were bad. So what these miners did, they gave themselves time, they banked time to react to the crisis. They didn't wait until they get dizzy; they waited until this bird did the dizziness for them, and then they left they left the mine. I'm gonna show you just a quick principle of how early warning as an anticipator works for you. Um, and we can see the parallels to the COVID, right? We, we have an, a signal, we have a chart here where the signal is very early on, is, uh, it's a very low signal. And then over time it gets louder. Um, another chart line here is the chance for intervention. So that means uh, the longer I wait reacting on this signal, the less chances I have to intervene. Now, every individual, everyone in this room, every company has what I call a threshold of awareness. This is when we start paying attention, right? When do you start paying attention to the hole you have in your tooth, right? Your tongue is investigating it for hours every day. And when do you actually make the call and go to the dentist, right? If you wait for that too long, it's going to be root canal. Um, and that happens often when our level of awareness is uh, not low enough. And so what happened is, we detecting signals. This is when the signal hits our awareness. That's when we start paying attention. And that's pretty late. We still need some time to formulate a decision. And we do that, it's too late. What do we need to do here is to start moving our level of, of awareness 
a lot further down. And when we're increasing our awareness, our threshold goes down, the awareness increases, we detect those signals much, much earlier, you know, and this, these may not be perfect signals, but we see what's happening. And the earlier we detect signals, the more time we have to make a decision, to make a better decision, uh, make it earlier, and basically, again, banking time. So give you a little exercise here that you can play. Uh, now, we're getting back to commuting, right? And so my favorite hobby in commuting is this anticipator exercise. And uh, what it is, is uh, I worked with the, with the National Association for uh, Convenience Stores a while back. And we were thinking, how can we you know, sell more Red Bull? That was actually the question, um, because there's a good margin and people love Red Bull. And here's an exercise you can do when you're back in a commute and uh, hate your Friday afternoon on the Beltway. Uh, just look at the car in front of you. The, the car will be there for a while, uh, as will you. And look what stickers they have on the back of the car. And then do an exercise. Try to predict, try to anticipate what this person would buy in a convenience store when they stop for gas, right? Because we all know the worst five minutes of our day is the boring newsreel that they show us at the gas station, right? The BP special oil that you need to put in your car, etc. So the challenge was, can we put something on that, on that channel based on the information we can read from the back of a car with a camera uh, to make an offer to that person that they will actually engage with? So that was the exercise, right? And so when you next time in there, you can start becoming an anticipator. Right here, these are a couple of examples of what people uh, people have on the back of their car. I just picked a few here, and uh, you know, I'm not sure if, you, if, if the chat is active, but if you want to want to play with, you can you can throw in a couple of a uh, couple of ideas here uh, if you want to want to guess with that. You know, the first one obviously, uh, no chance to buy Red Bull by this person if you know the logo, right? So this is a monster monster person so no luck here so you need to put an ad for monster on it uh it will be hard to to convince them and so you can go through these things and this is what we call early warning data right the, the car comes on the gas station a system or even a human being has the ability to to uh, pitch something we have the first you know a very affluent apple family here that can afford two cats so they are definitely in the affluent area that's a you know, it's a, it's a rich environment for marketing and consumer research people. You have somebody who runs marathons. But when you put a 20.6, uh, 26.2 sticker on it, we know that is a person who just run one marathon because every dedicated marathon runner will not expose themselves if putting a sticker. This is a person who did one marathon and put the sticker on it. So it's not a really fitness nerd, but okay, we give them, we give them credit, right? This is on my car. Uh, Honda Odyssey, right? When you have kids, uh, I used to be cool. That's when you end up, end up with a van and you're usually having no budget at all. So cheap offers are welcome. Uh, we have a teacher here. We can offer them a matching donation to the local school. And of course, we know the very vocal uh, crowd of vegans who also have a sticker on their back and you don't sell much bacon to that person. So if you wanna do this for another second, I know we are we're tight on the time here. But this is an, an exercise if you want to look at this uh, one more time. Uh, the more you do it, the more practice you get. And this is a part of becoming an anticipator. This is a, a very small exercise here just to kind of a warm up. But you can see there's a lot of information that you can read in. And uh, in, this, in the talk from Anton, he said, we started, and I'm reading this here, we started continuous listening we started to listen internally and externally. And this is a precursor to that, you know, being aware, started to listen so that they have some sort of early warning to what is coming along. This is the uh, anticipator skill set. So the last one here, and I hope I've still four or five minutes. Uh, Rebecca, how am I doing? Four minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes. All right, <laughs> we got to go through this. All right, so the improviser. This may not sound like, uh, uh, like, uh, like something, but in a crisis, perfect is the enemy of good. And so improvisation, I teach this for, for many years in, in multiple circumstances, is a, is a skill set. It's not just an emergency solution. 
um, there are a lot of exercises we're doing and why, why this is benefit. Many of you have seen, you know, we know the movie, the Titanic, right? Uh, how can we save more people on the Titanic? I would like to have an exercise because we don't have the time. So I tell you the obvious solution is, well, anybody put them on the iceberg, right? Why did nobody come up with that? Why didn't, this was the iceberg that was next to the Titanic, it was the culprit. And uh, this iceberg, um, you know, it doesn't look too bad on the left-hand side. You can bring people over. The difference between iceberg and Titanic, the iceberg floats, the Titanic, not so much. What is the problem here? People could not improvise because of something we call functional fixedness. The iceberg was the enemy. People in an emergency were not able to improvise that the iceberg can be saving. By the way, people always say they should have put more people in the boats. That is not true. They should, yes. But the procedure at the time that everybody trained for was to moderately load the boat, shuffle the people over to a rescue vehicle in the area, a rescue ship, and then come back because there was a lot of traffic in that transatlantic pipeline. And so it was at that moment that the people could not improvise. They were not able, they had rules and no mental flexibility to, to do otherwise. So this, this is uh, where improvisation comes in. Those of you who are familiar with the movie Apollo 13, you may also have seen uh, some of that uh, there. I wish, now we don't have the time, so we, we, we will skip the clip. But in the movie, there's a famous moment where they have to build this one. It's also a, an air cleaner, and that was built from spare parts. The Apollo astronauts would not suffocate uh, doing their space flight. So where does improvisation fit into a corporate environment? What improvisation skills and abilities do for your organization is you're moving people towards a larger comfort zone. You know, people are more comfortable dealing with uncertainty. They are more able to be in what we call the growth zone. And it means that they have capacity to deal with uncertainty, with uh, unknown uh, situations. And we can learn a lot from professional improvisers, which are, you know, comedians. We have prisoners who are very good at improvisation, musicians. We even have survival guys. I'm a big fan of that. I teach actually, I'm a survival coach or trainer, instructor, however you might call it. We have even teach a lot of executive courses using survival and bushcraft as a backdrop. And uh, one of the things I wanna leave you here with is to create something that we call in, in survival training, uh, the priorities of survival. And this is something that I want to share with you from the survival perspective. And then as a last slide, I'll show you the translation into a, into a business operation. So in survival training, when we teach people priorities, you know, when, when you're really dire, we're not talking camping here. We're talking a survival situation. Your plane crashed in the, in the Rocky Mountains type of survival situation, not bear grills humping on every, every mountain that is around there and eating some raw meat. That's not survival, that's TV. Um, the rules that we have are the rules of three. And it's very easy to remember. Uh, the rules of three go very easy. It's three minutes without oxygen. That means if you don't get, can breathe, you need to make sure you can start breathing or stopping the blood from coming out. We cannot be three hours without shelter. We cannot be three days without water. Um, we cannot be three weeks without food. Me, after the pandemic, I can easily make four weeks. Uh, without food. Uh, we cannot be three months without companionship. Most of us never thought about this, but uh, another pan important pandemic item, right? And uh, I added one to this, we cannot be three seconds without hope. So what this list does now in an emergency or crisis is you got a pre-established priority. There's no question when a crisis hit, how your organization is gonna function. These are the th things that we do in terms of priority. And you can translate that into what I call the decision-making time horizon. That's my last slide. I know my time is up. And uh, the time horizon, and this is something we can share after the session. Rebecca will send it out if you are interested in that. What it does is I've broken down kind of a crisis horizon or an emergency situation into five separate time horizons. There's this three day, 30 day, three months, 300 days, and three years. We all know 300 days is fake because it should be 365, but you know it just didn't fit into the three rule here. What this does, it gives you a list of priorities, what to do, who is in charge and what 
action item needs to be considered. The main message is here that this type of uh, generic list is something you can develop for all of your business. You can think about this if a crisis hit. Who is involved in each of these stages? One of the most important message for me is, and while I appreciate that a lot of executives were, you know, close to the front line, this is this is important, and it's important for guiding with culture and things like that. But the two two messages here is executives from the beginning of the crisis, other than moral support and the front lines, should absolutely and very quickly take care of the long view. You know, this is this is the time that you catch up again when you're coming out of any any crisis as much as it is emotionally draining and, and you know desirable for executives to be on the front line you have to spend time in the later stages of the recovery and last message this system works even better if you start up training and down training everybody in the organization that means everyone can step up at least one responsibility level in a crisis so that as a cascading effort that you as a head of the company or in your position, you are basically freed up to also work in a capacity one up of your current uh, position. And so I think that's all the time I have here. Rebecca, I hope that was interesting, was something uh, to think about and to uh, Maybe you know apply some of, uh, apply some of that next time around. There's a worksheet. Of course, I'm a professor. There's a worksheet that comes with that. If you're interested, we will send it out and uh, just play around. If you have questions or you know let's uh, need some inspiration, I'm uh, absolutely uh, available for all kinds of shenanigans and help as uh, as we go. And that's <laughs> all I have. Time Oliver, thank you today. so much for this. My LinkedIn is in the in the chat if somebody wants to connect. Super. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Oliver, there have been a number of questions that have come in yeah. um, really about how a company, like what practical tools you have companies can look at to start setting up scenario planning, risk management programs um, within their own organizations. And I think that you've touched on that a little bit and the worksheet I think is gonna go a long way to helping um, the companies who are present with us today and our honorees think um, more about this and, and be future oriented. So thank you yeah. so much for this. There are so many great takeaways that, that we could delve into right now, but I'd like to just say thank you for being a part of our event today. It's been really a true pleasure to hear from you. Um, and thank you, thank you so much for your, your support. Um, if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen, we will go ahead and close out our event because that is the concluding session of our program today. Before we log off, I would like to take a few more moments of your time to share some additional thoughts about um, today's program, um, and how we got to where we are today and provide some actionable steps that we can all take to keep this conversation and the learning going. So when I think back to the fall, how all of this started, I see that we set to learn, we set out to learn about how Maryland companies are adapting their global strategies and reaching their customers abroad during the pandemic. We found five companies to work with and ultimately we ended up here at a convening of some of the best business and research minds in the state. And I hope that today's event is just the setting of the stage for more conversations, research, and the development of practical tools that we all in the business and education communities in Maryland can continue to learn from. We at the Smith School have a lot planned for the fall, and we look forward to building partnerships and collaborating with all of you in the fall and into the future. So please do browse through the program for any details on just some of the many ways you can connect with the Smith School for executive and graduate education, hiring our talent, and working with our students on projects that can impact your company. You'll also find links to programs offered by our event co-sponsors in that program. Please also do take the survey about today's event to help give us a sense of what other kinds of programming you would find beneficial. Based on what you put there, we can follow up with you to design a customized executive education program to meet your company's needs or put you in touch with some of the faculty, including Oliver, 
that you met here today. And the link is being provided in the chat and will be sent out to you again via email um, following the event. I also invite you all to join our mailing lists and to follow us on social media to find out more about upcoming events just like this one. You are also welcome to get in touch with me directly if you're interested in meeting about any of the opportunities you've learned about today. And finally, I would like to thank a number of people without whom this event would not have been possible. I've already mentioned the selection committee, our case writer, and the faculty and staff you met during the roundtables, and I've also congratulated our honorees. But there are still a few more offices and individuals I'd like to thank, and it really does take a village. So thank you to our co-sponsors, the Office of Executive Education and the Office of Career Services here at Maryland Smith, as well as the Maryland Department of Commerce, the Maryland DC District Export Council, and the US Export Assistance Center in Baltimore. I'd also like to thank the US Department of Education and the Title VI side program that funded this initiative. Thank you also to the planning committee for the event, Andrew Krynick of the Maryland Department of Commerce, and Nick Bandura, Marina Augustidas, Chris Thompson, Stephen Bennett, and Allison Butler here at Marilyn Smith. And finally, great kudos to our Zoom team led by Marina Augustidas, AJ Rivera, Adam Schwal, Catherine Coleman. I have no idea how you've done this, but this has been a truly exceptional Zoom event. And with that, thank you everyone for participating in today's Maryland Business Adapts.